latest whispers and intel out of camp. This is what we do to lead every show, especially during this time of year. Just the latest that we're hearing. We've got an entire network of team insiders, the best in the business bar none. And I like to leverage them as much as we possibly can. No particular order here. Let's just start it off. I wanted to go to Knoxville, Tennessee. We did not talk about Tennessee the other night. And we um, got to talk about offensive line. I know a lot of people have asked us questions about Tennessee. And most of the time it is about the offense, but it's about Jared Garantano. Do you think he's going to be the starting quarterback? Or maybe do you think, hey, could Harrison Bailey be that guy? Well, to address Bailey, he hasn't really been active up there yet. He's in precautionary mode, I think I heard Jeremy Pruitt say. But as for that offensive line, watch that unit. Uh, I know a lot of you Tennessee Volunteer fans are, but watch that unit. It's one of the most important evolutions, kind of positionary evolutions, if you will, in the entire SEC this year when you're talking about whether fill in the blank, in this case, Tennessee, can contend. And I go back to two years ago. I remember when we were in Hoover for SEC Media Days. It was Pruitt's, It was going to be his first year, and he was trying to be as diplomatic as possible, but he was telling you, our offensive line sucks. Like, we can't even find, and he admitted this a year later, we can't even find enough bodies to put out there to scrimmage. They couldn't scrimmage. They couldn't practice properly. And so to fast forward two years later, being going into 2020 and be talking about offensive line as one of the strengths of the Tennessee football team is incredible. And it's a testament to how they've gone about rebuilding that roster, which contrary to popular belief, you cannot just do overnight. And the second thing is with this whole Cade Mays transfer, uh, waiver denied appeal in the process of happening type situation. Think about this. Cade Mays, five-star offensive lineman from the state of Tennessee. He just transferred uh, from Georgia to Tennessee. Think about the condition that your roster's in now where you could be counting on a five-star, former five-star offensive lineman to be ruled eligible. He's ruled ineligible, at least for now. That's the way it looks like it's going to shake out. And you can look at that and say, man, that's, uh, well, that's terrible. Oh, well, we'll still be fine though. Tennessee in a position now, how about that, where you can say, oh, we'll be okay. Oh, we would love to have had that five-star offensive lineman. We still hope we have him, but we'll be all right either way. They feel good. They feel markedly better about where they are right now than any point, not just in Pruitt's tenure, but the latter portion of the previous regime's tenure when it comes to offensive line. Now let's go to the state of Texas. There is stuff happening out here all over the place. So I wanted to go to University of first. So let's talk about uh, Texas. And they had a scrimmage yesterday. I believe it was Friday, Saturday. I get my days mixed up. But if you, this is why it's so important, guys. I tell you, if you're a member at 247sports.com, you know the value I'm already talking about. This is not a network where, you know, you subscribe to like auburnundercover.com and you only get the Auburn information. You get access to the entire network, all the team sites. And so, for example, Chip Brown, Taylor Estes, a lot of folks, I don't want to single anyone out, a lot of folks uh, run the Horns 24-7 site. So, you know, I can reach out to them and also a couple other folks that I knew out at Texas, and you can get this kind of information. And the kind of information I'm talking about is if you were going into the season and the last thing that you knew about Texas was, I remember some preview magazines where, you know, Bijan Robinson, that's a big name and it still is a big name now, don't get me wrong. Uh, we expect him to do big things, but I'll tell you this right now. I'm looking down at this piece of paper that I jotted down from being on the phone with someone early this morning, and it wasn't Bijan Robinson. He's kind of been held out uh, because of groin issues. Not Chip Brown over at Horns 24-7. I did see reported that. And Keontae Ingram, like, that's a name that you know. But I'll tell you the name that I have written down here is Rashawn Johnson. That is the kind of name, and this happens every year with a number of programs. It's a name that's just bursting onto the scene. It's not a nationally recognized name yet. It's not even a regionally recognized name yet. That dude, according to people close to the Texas program, may be the best running back they have on their roster right now. And I don't necessarily know that he's a household name, even amongst a lot of Texas fans. Admittedly, there's been a lot going on, so maybe you guys haven't been paying attention to every single practice report, but you write that name down, Rashawn Johnson. That's a guy who's making a lot of noise at Texas, and hey, the more the merrier in that backfield. Because Texas could, Texas could put together a pretty physical team this year, to be honest with you. Offensively, they could be as physical as they've been in quite a while. You couple that with obviously experience at the quarterback position. 
that's a good thing. You go to College Station at Texas A&M. I just kind of went all around the Lone Star State uh, last night and early this morning. I've made my thoughts well known on Kellen Mond, Texas A&M quarterback, Kellen Mond. I think he just kind of is who he is. You may see incremental improvement this year in this stat category or that stat category. I'm just a believer that he is who he is. Who he is is not a bad player. Who he is is not a great player. He is a good to very good college quarterback. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can win with that. But you got to have the proper supporting cast around him, really just as you do if you have a great quarterback, see Joe Burrow. So with Kellen Mom, everyone's focused on him, and I'm not all that focused on him, only because I can listen to Jimbo Fisher talk about how he's matured, and I can you know, listen to how he's got a better grasp of the offense. Listen, that's great. I, I would hope we didn't hear anything else other than that. He is who he is to me. I'm looking around him. And so I remember this time last year, everyone was excited about Baylor Cup. That was a big tight end signee they had. And then he got hurt and he was out. And so you ended up having uh, an all-American caliber tight end. It was just Wiedermeyer, who was one of the most physically impressive players I saw last year, by the way, at field level. And that was in week two, I think, when they played Clemson. That's the first time I saw him. Very impressive. Saw him again when they played Alabama. But point being, Wiedermeyer's back this year but Baylor Cup's back. Now, it remains to be seen if he's at 100%. If you are getting 100% of him, you never know about injury recovery timeline. Everyone out there is saying the right things, but it's still early there. So the point I'm making is watch that duo. If they have both those guys at or near 100%, talk about being able to be physical and being able to be multiple in those two tight end sets and having a couple of really all-American caliber talents at the tight end position – you got Gilbert down at LSU. A tight end could be a really, really fun position to watch in the SEC West this year. But outside of that, um, I'm, I'm looking at positions, and I'm looking at Texas A&M in particular, and when you're talking about the wide receiver position, you've got a guy. Well, you got one guy established, okay? Jamon Osmond is established, and that's the one you know you can count on. But outside of that, I remember sitting there – when we were doing our signing day show, and it wasn't the early signing day show, it was the regular signing day show. So Demond Demas, I believe, had already signed with Texas A&M. But that's a five-star, true freshman, wide receiver. That's a guy who has an opportunity to make an immediate splash impact. You want to talk about Kellen Mond all you want to, that's fine. I want to talk about who he's throwing the ball to. And I want to talk about dependable targets there. And that's one of the names I'm watching right now, Demond Demas. To this point, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but I will say this. That's the kind of guy that's got SEC freshman All-American, uh, national All-American freshman potential, and that's the kind of guy who in a 23-17 game late in the fourth quarter is the kind of guy that can make a play that can be the difference between you going 7-3 and three and you going 8-2, and 9-1. and one. Like That's the kind of skill set he has. It's up to Jimbo Fisher and company to plug him in year one accordingly. Now, it's terrible at TCU. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys saw this. You know, we were doing the other night an episode and a segment on Late Kick Live about the Big 12 and how I believe and still believe it is wide open. TCU is a program that a lot of insiders uh, that I talk to and that you listen to out in the Big 12, they've thrown them around. Everyone knows Oklahoma. Of course, everyone's going to talk about Texas. Oklahoma State's in pretty much everyone's preseason top 15, even before the shrinking of the sport happened. But TCU was a program that a lot of folks out in the Big 12 thought was kind of lying in the weeds a little bit. And part of their reasoning there, among other things, was Max Duggan at quarterback. Max Duggan's not starting at quarterback for TCU, at least for the first few games, and it looks like maybe for an extended period of time. It was this past week. I didn't talk about it Thursday night. I kind of wanted to let it simmer a little bit and see if we got any more information out of it. But Gary Patterson, the head coach there at TCU, informed everyone that, Max Duggan's not going to start the season. He had a medical condition, and I don't even want to speculate on what it is, but they caught it, mainly because he was there. They were able to catch it. So he's going to be on the shelf for a little while dealing with that. Now, normally you would think, okay, well, I mean, listen, it's a, it's a major FBS program. It's a Power 5 program. They've obviously got adequate quarterback depth. I don't know that TCU does. Uh, there is a name there that if you're a Georgia fan, for example, you remember the name Matthew Downing? That's a guy who transferred out of Georgia. He played mop-up duty a couple of games, uh, from what I can remember. But he ran fourth string for TCU last year. 
that's the guy who in all likelihood is your starter this year to start the season. I want to remain optimistic and I hope Max Duggan, first off, independent of football, I hope he recovers from whatever it is he's dealing with and I'm glad they caught it, but I always want to remain optimistic. There is no reason to ever write teams off in early to mid or late August this season or any other season. I don't see any way they contend for the Big 12 if they don't have Max Duggan for the meat of their schedule this year. So it's not optimistic, but I think that is reality. Another thing before we move on here, uh, this is not necessarily intel, but there have been some people vocal this week about a couple of quarterbacks not named Trevor Lawrence, and that is Matt Campbell up at Iowa State, my Iowa State Cyclones, just openly touting Brock Purdy as the best quarterback in America. And that was Matt Campbell's words, not mine. He said, I, don't, I think his exact words, I don't know what his exact words were, paraphrasing was, I wouldn't take any quarterback in America over uh, Brock Purdy. Now, I don't have a problem with that because you remember when we came out with our 24-7 sports top 50 players in college football this year. I think we had Purdy at 35, and that was the guy that I took issue with not being listed higher. And they asked us to do one paragraph's write up on the players that you thought were listed too low. I said, how in the world are we finding 34 players out there that we'd rather have other than Brock Purdy? I don't know. I'm not necessarily saying he's the best in America, but I think he's good enough to help the Cyclones contend in the Big 12. And another one, you're starting to hear more people chirp about Bo Nix. I think Bo Nix is probably the most overlooked returning quarterback in America this year in a major program. Like, does anyone believe Auburn's going to win the SEC? Does anyone believe that Bo Nix is going to challenge to be the postseason first team All American quarterback or, or, or All SEC quarterback? Like, does I don't hear many people say it, but yet this past week I heard some people speaking up. I think it was Philip Marshall there at AuburnUndercover.com, our Auburn 24-7 site, that said, I think he's the best quarterback in the SEC. He got some pushback on that, but I don't know how hard you can push back. Like, even if I didn't believe that, I don't know how hard I can push back on that because who are you really hitching your wagon to? I know Florida fans think it's a slam dunk that Kyle Trask will run circles around Bo Nix this year. I'm pretty sure Alabama fans think whoever starts for them, in all likelihood, Mac Jones, would run circles around Nix. Okay, but, I mean, would you bet your life on it? I don't think you'd bet your life on it right now. So just some things to think about, and I will tell you this as we conclude this and we move on. I've never seen a year like this, and that goes without saying, but I've never seen a year where information is so tightly guarded and so hard to come by. With the COVID measures in place, the folks you would normally rely on to be getting you some information, just a trickle of inside information out of these scrimmages and practices, they're not there. It is really, really hard. There are some places we probably won't get any legitimate updates on other than what the university chooses to release. That's abnormal, but that makes the trinkets of information that we do get, and I can share with you in this segment every show now, all the more valuable. So we're keeping our, our, our eyes out and our ears to the ground. 